and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, things to come, instruments they used, you name it, we talk about it. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and the co-author with Adrian Sinclair of... The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. And I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk, and the host of his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is packed with Beatles-related interviews and stuff. Hello, Ken. How's it going? It's going well, Alan. And uh, I like that. Packed with Beatles stuff. Packed. Very descriptive there. Yes, that's why I get the Beatles <laughs> ups. Um, and also Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUVFM 90.7 in the New York area. He's been there since February 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. <laughs> Hi, Darren. Okay, Hi. today we have um, a guest with us, or Will, um, after the news, um, and that is Albert Glinsky, who's a composer and an author. He's written a couple of really excellent books about electronic instruments and their inventors, um, and we're going to be talking to him about his new book about Bob Moog whose synthesizer you know um, mm. on quite a few Beatles and solo Beatles, well, one Beatle and s several solo Beatles recordings. And he'll be here just after the news. But first, the news. Ken? Okay. Thank you, Alan. This is going to be kind of brief, not as much as in uh, last few shows. We'll start with a reminder that uh, this coming Wednesday, March the 15th, there'll be that very big concert honoring Paul McCartney at Carnegie Hall with various artists performing his music, including Peter Asher, Denny Lane, Nancy Wilson of Heart, Christopher Cross, Natalie Merchant, Lyle Lovett, Bruce Hornsby, Graham Nash, a whole host of others. And uh, we'll have to wait and see whether or not Paul shows up. I know on our last show, Darren said, in most cases at these events, the person being honored doesn't appear, but we'll certainly know very soon. Thanks to Fred Velez, our monkey man, our expert on the monkeys, we learned that John Lennon's album Live in New York City, which took the audio from their afternoon performance from John and Yoko's one-to-one -one benefit concert, is now being made available on John Lennon's YouTube channel, also on Spotify and Apple Music. The album for this came out in 1986. While we're still waiting for a Sometime in New York City box set, and at this moment, we still don't know when and if that'll happen. In the meantime, you do have Strictly the Audio from the one-to-one -one concert available online. All right. Luca Parasi's new book on Paul is officially out now. Do I have it here? I do. Just came in the mail. Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas. The Stories Behind the Songs, Volume 1, from 1970 to 1989. Luca is known for his previous book on Paul, Recording Sessions, 1969 to 2013, A Journey Through Paul McCartney's Songs After the Beatles. The new book is 542 pages. The book consists of 346 song sheets including songs written by other composers, as well as 50 unreleased tracks, each providing detailed information of musicians and recording dates, including anecdotes, contemporary interviews, together with exclusive interviews with key personnel from the author. It's enriched with over a thousand footnotes and with dozens of illustrations and photographs. Albums, tours, and other events provide a background to the stories behind the songs. Luca also has a volume two planned for next year, and he's been a busy man in many ways. Where Paul is concerned, he was appointed one of two official Italian translators for Paul's lyrics book. 
And he also collaborated with MPL on the label copy for Paul's singles box set. Hmm. On our last show, we learned that George Harrison's Dark Horse Records acquired the back catalog, 16 albums from Leon Russell. Well, one of those albums is about to be released on March the 17th. That's this Friday. Leon's 2001 album, Signature Songs, in which he revisited his most classic compositions in stark piano and voice renditions. The uh, upcoming release, which sports a new cover art, uh, new cover art, will premiere on vinyl and will also arrive on CD and in digital formats. Finally, a couple of things about Peter Asher. A while ago, I mentioned that he would be involved producing a brand new album for Susanna Hoffs of the Bangles, and it is out. It's called The Deep End. It's an album of all covers, a mixture of classic rock songs like The Rolling Stones Under My Thumb, Denny Lane's Say You Don't Mind, and Squeeze's Black Coffee in Bed, with more current artists like Billie Eilish, Ed Sheeran, and Brandy Clark. Not only that, you know from time to time, Peter does tour very often with someone else to share the stage with. And in recent years, he has teamed up with Jeremy Clyde of Chad and Jeremy. They are back for one date so far, which will be very close to me at the Kate in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. That will be on very easy date to remember, June 18th. You'd think he'd be celebrating Paul's birthday that day, but no, <laughs> he's doing a concert with Jeremy. So, uh, yeah, and that's that's all the news I have this time. That's it? That's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Ken. You're quite welcome, Alan. And on to the main show. And now we... So, as I mentioned, we have a special guest today, the distinguished composer and author Albert Glinsky. Um, he is the, we're going to talk about his most recent book, Switched On, Bob Moog and the Synthesizer Revolution, which we have right here. And there is Albert. Uh, every, uh, when we're finished, the everyone has windows in different places. So I can't say which window he's in, but he's the one wearing the Moog t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> rather obviously. <laughs> um, also have, you know, if, if you're interested in electronic music, this is his previous one, Theremin, Ether Music and Espionage. It's um, a gripping tale of uh, the guy who obviously invented the theremin, but was also a Russian spy. You know, on the side, yeah. um, Bob Moog wasn't anything like that, uh, so far as I can tell. No. But um, uh, and you know, obviously, I think most people watching know that there is intersection between the world of the Moog synthesizer and the Beatles. Um, both as a group, I'm on Abbey Road. They used it on several tracks, and uh, George Harrison made his electronic sound album um which we're going to talk about um probably a good deal because there's some controversy about about um, right. george's right. Mode work here um and uh for theremin um you know there's there's always i mean the, the the big example in rock and roll that comes up is always the beach boys good vibrations but that doesn't really use a theremin does it no, it's uh, an electro theremin, which was a device uh, that was actually a sort of workaround by uh, Paul O.W. Tanner, who was a session trombonist in uh, Hollywood for uh, film scores. And he just decided one day that um, he wanted to come up with something that was like a theremin because he witnessed a lot of scores being recorded for Hollywood films where a thereminist came in, but he knew how difficult it was to play the theremin because you know, you're moving your hands in these electromagnetic fields in front of two antennas, one for volume and one for pitch. And it's like, you know, doing this kind of thing. The coordination is, is just impossible. So he did this work around. He just put an oscillator in a box basically with a little pulley mechanism and then put it in a like a slider thing so you could slide it back and forth and get the sort of wee kind of uh, sounds uh, and you know then it was a volume control and it was just it was manually operated and so uh, the Beach Boys uh, you know uh, that Brian Wilson wanted that effect and so Tanner came in and he actually uh, you know he played on those sessions 
And um, so what you're hearing is a theremin-like sound. And I, I always, when I'm introducing the idea of the theremin to people I'm familiar with the theremin in, uh, uh, you know, in lectures or audiences, I always mention uh, good vibrations because it's the one thing people can say, oh, yes, that sound, but uh, it's a, basically an imitation theremin. Yeah, it's not, not really the real thing. And there's actually a, um, a Moog-related uh, story that goes with that. It's in, um, the story's actually in, in both the theremin book and the Moog book. Uh, it's that uh, when Mike Love, when they went on tour, uh, and they wanted to do good vibrations. Uh, Mike Love said, well, we've got to have a contraption to bring with us because Paul Tanner refused to go on tour with them. And so they went to um, Bob Moog to get a theremin because Bob, you know, made lots of theremins. And they tried it out and they said, no, 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 this is too complicated. You know, we, we can't do this. <laughs> so Bob actually made a ribbon controller for them that he called a Melsonar. And that's what they took on tour. And a ribbon controller is really just a resistance strip that you run your finger along uh, and, you know, uh, high and low. And it just, it can create a, you know, sweeping sound with your hand, but you can do a vibrato on it and all of that. So um, there's actually, um, I guess it's the official music video uh, of Good Vibration from the time period from like 1966 and you can see Mike Love there's like a close-up of his hand on that ribbon controller moving back and forth so that was kind of what they took on tour and so Bob made that for them because they they didn't want to handle an actual theremin and the funny thing is it's probably the most famous thing called a theremin now for most people uh, yeah yeah it's, it's very it's very odd uh, but but as i say i use it myself as an example because what else uh you know i mean you can talk about those films if people are aware of them you know spellbound and the lost weekend from 1945 with miklos rocha's wonderful scores that have the theremin like doubling a violin section and you know creating these uh, really uh, spooky effects and things like that and uh you know of course led zeppelin and uh, you know there there are a number of examples in in rock I mean with using the theremin, but no, nothing like good vibrations. <laughs> the day the earth stood still, of course, you know that you know sort of yeah. cult sci-fi flick from 1951. Yeah, lots of theremin. Have you played one? Uh, well, uh, I own theremins and I demonstrate them when I uh, go around and do my dog and pony shows, but I'm not a uh, thereminist by any means. <laughs> I just, I kind of, you know, poke away at the air and I sort of show the principle, but I, I've never taken the time to really study it. Uh, so there's actually an online video that's gotten a lot of, um, a, a lot of hits that, um, Moog Music Incorporated actually has on their site, and it's me kind of telling the history of the theremin, and, and they have my demonstration in there, and it's just, again, it's like me kind of poking the air to get kind of a scale out of it, you know, but I'm not a, I, I'm certainly not a thereminist. <laughs> so I Could I just ask, I just wanted to ask, some of the, the sci-fi, if you will, TV programs of the past, where I hear those weird sound effects, like My Favorite Martian or something like that, would that be a theremin? Well, it's interesting you should mention my favorite Martian because actually that was Paul Tanner and his electro theremin. So when when Ray, um, uh, what's his uh, Ray Walston, uh, Walston, right? When the yeah. um, when the antennas come out of his head, that is the yeah. electro theremin. Yeah. So anything beyond about 1960, 61. Uh, would be the electro theremin. Prior to that, it was Samuel Hoffman. He was the foot doctor by day, quite literally, and a thereminist by night. <laughs> and uh, he was he made some uh, lounge music recordings in the 50s that are pretty neat, you know, sort of uh, the theremin as a kind of uh, lullaby, wordless lullaby with a, you know, sort of light string orchestra and a choir, you know, sort of light popular music. But um, right. he was the main thereminist on all those, um, yeah, films like The Day the Earth Stood Still and everything through the 50s. But then when you get into uh, the 60s, uh, he already retires and on the scene comes uh, Paul Tanner. So all of that, yeah, would be electro theremin. Hmm. Okay. Um, sort of in the, you know, we should do a little bit of, uh, you know, Bob Moog up to the Beatles as, as an introduction, um, because I, I think a lot of people, you know, know the name, but don't know that there's a, a guy there, you know, um, and he sort of took piano lessons, but wasn't really a musician, particularly was he, he liked music, but he he wasn't really a, a, a player, right? 
No, not at all. It's a it's a very strange uh, story actually that I tell in the book because uh, those were the days when enforced piano lessons were very much the thing among uh, sort of uh, middle class parents. And uh, his mother did what was very typical. Uh, Wendy Carlos had the same kind of uh, experience. Um, describes that where you know the the parent would stand over you or the teacher with like a wooden spoon and whack you on the knuckles if you hit a wrong note. You know. So Bob uh, he described his mother giving him piano lessons, forcing them on him as like somebody uh, giving you an enema. I mean, that's that's what he, and I quote that in the book, you know, that that was how much he enjoyed his piano lessons. Um, but, but he did like music and he um, he escaped to the basement. He had these two du dual worlds and his father was the engineer and they did all these hobby projects and that's where he discovered the theremin. So the theremin kind of combined his interest in music uh, in the early days, in his um, college days, with his interest in, in, in regular music. And he liked music and he liked classical music. I think a lot of people don't realize that also. That was really kind of his upbringing, you know, and he kind of, um, he always says that he slipped backwards on a banana peel getting into the electronic musical instrument business, you know, because this kind of happened, you know, he didn't plan for it. And he kind of slipped into the rock world also, like somebody sort of slipping backwards on a banana peel because, uh, you know, I tell a story in the book, it was when he went out to LA in 19 1967. Um, that was when they discovered his instrument and it, it hooked up perfectly with the zeitgeist, you know, and, and uh, so um, the first album ever to use um, a synthesizer, as far as I know, sort of pop album was uh, the Zodiac Cosmic Sounds and that uh, he was present for that recording session and he was really kind of disgusted with the scene out there and he said I don't I didn't know if I wanted my instrument to be involved with that and of course you know it was like the floodgates are open and he was just like washed away in a tsunami of of, of pop and rock and jazz and everything and he really didn't have any choice and that's kind of how he got into it but you know he started uh, his whole his whole uh, background in this was that he was just selling theremins and theremin kits and he went to a convention and he met Herb Deutsch, who was a college professor from Hofstra University, who had uh, built one of Bob's theremin kits and they got to talking and Herb was a composer. And uh, he, he wrote electronic music, you know, music concrete, you know, using tape methods, splicing tape and running things backwards and forwards and, you know, filtering everything. But he was very frustrated and he said, is there any kind of device or machine you could build for me that would allow me to do all of this without all this tape splicing and, and everything that I have to go through? And that was when they got together and that was the first prototype ever synthesizer and her was I guess you'd call him a, a classical avant-garde composer. You know, he really, he, he dabbled in some jazz too, but he, he really wasn't a jazz musician. Um, so Bob came up through this, you know, sort of complex classical world of, uh, you know, people like Stockhausen and, you know, all of these electronic music uh, um, composers, uh, you know, Musik Concrete, Varese, people like that. That's sort of what he knew. Uh, and he also uh, knew the theremin. So when he came, when the when the Beatles came along and discovered it, well, actually um, uh, George Harrison uh, uh, through a recording session. You you probably know this um, for um, uh, uh, Lomax a Lomax recording session in December of '68. That's when Harrison first saw the Moog, and that's sort of how how it all happened. Mm -hmm. Whose Moog was it? Well, I'm guessing that at that point, if it was December of 68, it would have belonged to Paul Beaver because Beaver, uh, uh, for the first time, bought a Moog in March of 68. So Beaver was taking it around um, to recording sessions because nobody really owned one then. And so Harrison saw it and um, Bernie Krauss was there too. Beaver and Krauss were, you know, this team and they, they brought the Moog everywhere. And so um, for the... Uh, uh, Lomax session, uh, which was, uh, I guess, I mean, you would all know, you all know this more than me, I guess. It was one of the early Apple uh, recordings. Um, yes. And uh, and so uh, three of the Beatles were on that session. And I'm trying mm -hmm. to remember who, who wasn't. You probably. All, all but John. All but John. Right, okay. right. And so uh, uh, anyway, when uh, when they sh when they shut down, when you know, when they wrapped that particular session, uh, there was uh, the Moog and there was uh, Bernie and um, and uh, 
uh, uh, George Harrison and George Harrison uh, with his love. I mean, I've always I've always felt that that he in particular who brought the sitar into the group and who, you know, loved unusual sounds. And I actually really like Wonderwall music, too. I mean, I don't know how you all feel mm -hmm. about that, but, you know, I like the sort of Indian influence and all of that. It's really, really neat. And uh, uh, so his interest in new sounds, he he said to Bernie, well, you know, can you demonstrate this thing to me? I think, Alan, is this what, what you were, we were going to sort of get to the controversy? Maybe you want to introduce the, what, what your angle on it, and then I can pick it up from there. My angle on it is some point in the 1980s, so it was only like 20 some odd years after the event, had lunch with Bernie Krauss. And he said, so, you know, uh, George's uh, electronic sound album, Let's hold it up again. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, of course. And he said, well, you know, that I, I'm not sure that he distinguished between the two tracks when we had lunch, um, but oh. he must have, because only one of them he's he's saying really is his. And he said, you know, basically, that's just tapes of me demonstrating the Moog to George. And he went and took the tapes and he put it out as, um, this is a little reductive, but he put it out as, as his own piece. And he pointed out that, you know, down here, if you have the original album, you can't really see it on the, the silvered screen. out portion. Yeah. It says yeah. like with Bernie Krause and then there's, a wash of silver paint over it getting and, and, and i don't have the original I, of course i just have a, a cd of it well of course right and then it does credit yes. bernie also yeah, yeah it does credit Fine. him on the inside um but took him off the cover and um he's was quite bitter about that he wrote to rolling stone at the time saying um i i, I guess our uh, idols really do have feet of clay and um you know and here it was the 1980s and he was still really quite upset um but it was not quite as simple as that story so why don't you uh right exactly well um i did want to say i i i'm glad that you have the silvered out version because i I've, I've never been able to find one but you i did want to ask you so you can see clearly uh the name bernie kraus under that i mean it's pretty clear that it's really there you can i mean i'm not sure that i would have noticed it if bernie had right. it out um <laughs> but uh if yeah. you know what you're looking for if you know what you're looking for yeah. and you know and the silver thing is there on the cd but on the cd it's it's so reduced it, it's it's just silver yeah you can hardly see it yeah, yeah. well uh, i i research this quite a bit and of course bernie writes about it in his um it's a sort of an early autobiography uh book uh that, that he wrote um uh and he he discusses this he has a chapter about it uh, and I've heard him talk about it. And uh, I think he told me, I interviewed him in person in, in San Francisco and uh, a number of years ago, and I'm sure he must have told me about it. But in any case, I've, I've heard the story many times. Um, and of course, what actually happened was, yes, apparently he did do demonstrations of the Moog, you know, sound samples, you know, I mean, like a series of very short samples of, you know, you can do this, you can make white noise blasts, you know, you can, you know, change a morph of sound through the filter so that it changes, you know, all these different types of things, these sounds, it was like a catalog of sounds, sort of like wallpaper samples, you know, well, if somebody wants to, you know, get wallpaper and you just flip through the book and show them the samples, like you can, you can do this, you can do that. Um, and apparently George had told the um, recording engineer to keep the, the tape running during the demonstration and then I guess made off of the tape and I guess Bernie didn't realize that. Um, the thing well, is that in the book that it was three in the morning. Right, right. Which uh, which I can believe is probably, you know, because they wrapped the session very late and I think it was just the two of them left in the studio. But the thing that I feel that I kind of opened up in the book that nobody talks about, including Bernie, is uh, when you listen to the actual, it's called No Time or Space, is, is what George called that particular cut. Um, uh, and it, it related to his practice of, of transcendental meditation. Um, but that's what he called it. But when you listen to it, yes, they are sound samples, but they are mixed in a way that it's a multi-track mix. 
So it's pretty sophisticated. You know, it's not just a single tape running with somebody poking the keys and going, okay, so you can do this, okay, and then five second pause, and here's another thing. He actually has things fading in, fading out, it's been mixed, it's, it's a landscape of sound. So um, that's not what Bernie would have done, I'm sure. I mean, Bernie was just showing him what you could do, and I really believe that George took it and mixed it into something that makes a musical composition. I mean, it's not everybody's taste, you know. <laughs> Roger McGuinn, <laughs> I mentioned this in the book, and he was pretty strong in saying, you know, it's what you do when you first set up your Moog, you know, and you're just kind of uh, trying out sounds, and well, I mean, that's what that was, but I still say that George mixed it into something, and I raised the question in the book, which is, a, a, I mean, I would be interested in, in what you all feel about this, but in those early days of um, the Moog synthesizer, was a synthesis a, a composer, songwriter, did they have any intellectual property claims on demonstrating sounds, you know. I mean, if you were a sound effects person and you you sat in a lab and you you put on a you know DVD of, of you know the, the BBC sound effects and said, here's a car crashing, you know, here's some screeching brakes, you can do this, you can do that, and then somebody takes those, it's just a library of sounds that you know are are in the public domain, and you mix them into something and you call it your composition. I, that seems perfectly legitimate, and they were listed on the Lomax album actually, Bernie uh, Bernie and uh, Paul uh, as, um, I can't remember what it is now, it's like a special effects, I think. <laughs> they weren't listed as songwriters, composers, producers, uh, uh, you know, they weren't listed in the personnel of performers, they, you know, they, they were special effects, you know. So the question becomes, okay, so he was demonstrating some special effects that are possible on the Moog synthesizer, and then George took them and, and you know, sort of uh, uh, put the elements into a composition. So. I don't know. I still see that a lot of it is George. And did Bernie really have any intellectual claim on it? He said, what I also don't understand is that Bernie says, I, I, and I also quote this in the book, he said, I didn't, he told, he claims he told George, I don't really like it very much, but if you want to put it out on an album, then we need to talk about, you know, uh, sharing royalties or whatever. And he said he didn't really like it very much, but then he also claims uh, in, in his book that he was planning on using these things for his own uh, forthcoming album that he was going to put out. So I can never figure out, he didn't like it very much, but then he was planning on using it. It was his intellectual property and, uh, you know, so I, I don't know. It's like Bernie did the Nonesuch Guide. I don't know if you if you know about that, the Nonesuch Guide for Electronic Music. Um, he did that. Um, around, uh, it was a little bit later than that. And, and it's a really, it's an important thing. Again, it's like wallpaper samples of all different types of sounds. But the, the beauty of it was, it was something that Jack Holtzman put out on Electra Records. And it's like a sound effects record, except for Moog. So advertising people could go into a session and say, you know, cut number 23, you hear that sound, that's what I like. I want that on my, you know, Coca-Cola commercial or whatever. And then there was a description of what, you know, what recipe of, um, you know, patch chords you put into the Moog to basically create that sound, you know, what settings. So it was no longer just give me a chirping sound, you know, give me a gurgling sound. And then, you know, it's a, well, how do we do that? You know, uh, there was actually a vocabulary. So he put together that album and it's got all all of these samples on it how different is that than what he was showing George you know uh, but but he didn't claim intellectual property for that either I think in except for the fact that at the beginning and the end there was a little jazz tune that he that he wrote you know for the album but but the sound effects I mean they're sound effects and they were free to be used by anybody so you know and the second side or the other half of it's the CD of the um, uh, electronic sound of Harrison um, under the Mercy Wall was his own composition. And again, uh, you know, it's not, I don't know, I don't think it's fantastic. I, I don't know how, I, Alan, I don't know how you, you feel about it, but it's, uh, I, I describe it in the book. It's, uh, I don't know, he was trying out his Moog and he thanks his two uh, Siamese cats um in the credits and i i'm sure that's because they must have walked across the keyboard while uh you know mm -hmm. the recording flight was on <laughs> so uh jostic and <laughs> there was a, 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 bit, a bit of a confusion uh here in this country 
I understand, because those two selections uh, were erroneously reversed uh, in the U.S. on the on the vinyl pressings. I mean, there yeah. was probably no second pressing of electronic sound once. Yeah, it, I don't think so. Once it was out of print, Zapple Records was closed down. But right. um, uh, I don't think it was every pressing around the uh, around the world. But in the U.S., they had reversed the sides, which they've since corrected uh, on the CD, the CDs, because it's right. actually released twice. Right, right. But there, there's no doubt that No Time or Space is the Bernie samples, you know, mixed into a composition and Under the Mercy Wall uh, is, uh, you know, Harrison's own composition. Oh. So, uh, um, yeah, very different than what we would expect from George, I guess. <laughs> I have, a, I, I've been thinking about this since I knew we'd be talking about it and, and what, what the sort of, let's say, uh, moral uh, aspect of you know, whether this is plagiarism, whether this is theft. Um, okay, so I have here, I should have taken it out, but I have um, a, a disc of drum loops made by Mick Fleetwood. And it's made so that you can put it into a, a, a digital workstation and you can build your own drum part for a piece you want to record um, all with Mick Fleetwood. And the drum part when you finish it won't be Mick Fleetwood playing it, but it also will be Mick Fleetwood playing it because it's all, you know, but the thing is that that disc is sold um, royalty free. And so the intention is that you can use those however you want in a commercial thing, if you want, or a non-commercial, whatever you want to do, but they're selling it to you for that. And Mick Fleetwood is presumably be being paid to do it um and you know and, and george is working in a world before samples as such you know but the mick fleetwood thing is is sort of like a collection of samples you know like when uh, michael jackson used a bit of the george sell recording of the beethoven ninth um, the Cleveland Orchestra very quickly, I don't know, how, I'm surprised they were able to identify it on a Michael Jackson recording, but they were there with their lawyers saying, no, you can't just take a bit of our sound. And um, and and so I think, you know, the, the, the laws hadn't been worked out by George's time because there wasn't sampling as such and there wasn't an industry of selling samples for for further use but in a way i think that's what bothers bernie krauss that you know he didn't he didn't sell those to george uh, for george's use to do whatever he wanted with he didn't even know george was recording them he was just demonstrating um so i think that's his issue so so george did make a piece out of it that wasn't what bernie played for i mean I, I believe he honestly did that's right because i you know i mean it's it doesn't sound to me like bernie if bernie i mean i'm just following the logic here it's a multi-track recording that um that george put out mm -hmm. and to do multi-tracks uh you would have to tell the recording engineer i would imagine okay now i'm going to put the put this on another track and put it under this put this on top of that but apparently he didn't know that there was a recording even going on so my sense is that he was just doing a demonstration here are white uh, white noise shot glass you know uh you know here's an example of a um uh, you know, what a what a sequencer can do. Now I'm going to take this sound and I'm going to uh, filter the high end and show you what that sounds like. Now let's do this. Now let's do that. And it's probably all, you know, just one continuous demo because he thought it was just a spontaneous demo and George was just going to be impressed and say, yeah, I like that. I think I'll buy one of these. You know, I think that's all that was really about. And um, so the fact that the, the, the final product, what? Oh, he did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that—that's the story that Bernie tells when he delivers it uh, to uh, uh, Ken Fonz. You know that uh, that he he delivers it, and then the next day he arrives. You know because it had just come in, and George says, "I want to play you something I did on a synthesizer." <laughs> and he said, "What do you mean? You know, it just came last night." And then obviously Bernie heard this thing. They go, "Well, wait a second. That was uh, you know two months ago, and that sounds like the sounds that I demonstrated." So you know, obviously uh, he had taken the tape long before he even had his own synthesizer in hand and just mixed it down and made it into 
into that. But I don't know. It, it's it's a it's an interesting uh, dilemma. But uh, I I don't know. I still would compare it to. I don't know. I'm trying to think of an analogy. You know, if you, if you're uh, in a kitchen with a master chef and the person says, uh, you know, uh, here's some oregano and here's this and here's that and you know, here are some ingredients and you see you could use these and I'll tell you what, I'll put them in little bottles for you and you could take them home. You know, this is a special oregano. This is a special cayenne. This is a special this. And then you go home and you use it in a dish. Is the master chef going to come and say? wait a second, those were the samples I gave you and you didn't credit. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I'm on the side of George. <laughs> I, I don't think uh, that, that Bernie really had any claim to it, especially in those days, because anybody could have done that. Paul could have shown him the same sounds anyone could have. It was not an artistic creation. I think that's what it really comes down to with intellectual property. It wasn't intended. It wasn't intended as just you could do this, you could do that, you, you know? I, I don't think it was something that was thought out particularly. So I don't know. <laughs> think of it more as like found sound. You yeah. Know? Like there were composers who uh, would go, you know, I mean, wandering around the street, recording bits of traffic and recording this and that, and then taking it home, making it into a piece. And, and that's what George did, except that there was someone playing the, those sounds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, definitely. I mean, if you held up a microphone for Musique Concrete and you, you know, got some car horn, could the person who owns the car or the person who made the car come after the person? And I, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, in, in, in the traditional sense, when it comes to like songwriting credits, you tend to think of just lyrics and melody. And those are the people who write the songs. And we've debated here on this show what happens in the case of the Beatles when George Harrison comes up with the the four guitar notes in And I Love Her, which is such a a key part of that song. And he's not given any credit as a songwriter or all the contributions that George Martin made to Beatles recordings and in arranging. And they're not given credit as songwriters. So in the liberal sense, I think that probably Bernie Krause should have been given uh, you know, credit for songwriting with George Harrison with this. But then, well, what, you know... Does- I, I just wanted to say bring on up... the album with the assistance of Bernie Krause. Uh, yeah. he did, and you know that's Bernie's portrait on the cover. Yes, yes. This, I, I didn't know that. That, that was this is supposed <laughs> to be Bernie. Yeah, it... so I mean, it, well, he's got the bow tie, you know, and the <laughs> pocket square and everything. But uh, I, I mean, I feel that he did credit Bernie in a certain way. It's just Bernie didn't get any quid, you know. <laughs> but uh, right. as I pointed out in the book, there probably wouldn't have been much quid to go around. I'm not sure it sold very well. Do, do we know the sales numbers, Alan? Does anyone know? Uh, I it, it only it, went to 191, I think, on the Billboard yeah. charts. On the Billboard so, charts, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think, think of, like a week or two, it was that was on the chart. I can think of another example that would have been actually around the time that this was happening, which is they had a Mellotron. And the Mellotron <laughs> has samples of people playing, including this big flamenco guitar thing that became the beginning of Bungalow Bill. So George could argue, well, if if we were able to use that, on a record on a Lennon McCartney song, you know, no one else credited. Um, why can't I use a thing that, you know, sounds like a cricket chirping for a couple of seconds on my piece, you know? Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, 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 it's a very, it's a very interesting debate that you can have about this, you know, intellectual property, copyright, all that. What yeah. about revolution number nine? Well, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because that certainly has lots of atmospheric sounds and, uh, you, you know, and all sorts of things. And I, I didn't even know. I mean, the voices on that, are those just the four Beatles or do they have other people who interject things? There is a um, the, the thing that is often um, uh, called an operatic thing is actually an Arabic singer um, who is a pretty well-known Arabic singer. I, I can't remember his name. Um, there's a bit of Dame Myra Hess playing Schumann. <laughs> oh, really? <Yes. laughs> Did she get royalties, I wonder? Oh. 
She didn't get royalties. And there is a recording of um, a bit of a uh, Vaughn Williams choral piece in there. You know, I mean, they're in EMIs. They just went into the tape library and 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 and, and records as well and just took samples. Um, you know, they you really could probably say they invented sampling. <laughs> I mean, of the, of the Beatles, the only voices you hear, obviously, are John's and George's. Right? I don't think Paul and Ringo had anything to do with Revolution 9, but I could be wrong. Ah. Um, I hear but John's voice. You hear George there, right? at one point. Clearly, it's clear as day, you hear George talking. And Yoko, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think you hear George Martin in the very beginning. Oh, really? Oh, that very... There's a very, very faint, if you yes. listen closely, as the song before, Cry Baby Cry, ends, you hear a discussion between two people, um, and... And one of them is George Martin. George yes. Martin, and I forget who the other person he's talking to, and it sounds as though one person is is apologizing to George Martin about something... I think I read somewhere where it was he didn't bring a bottle of wine or something like that. And then it's like very faintly you hear what it sounds like it's a bitch. <laughs> and then and then the piano comes in that starts. And I have like played that when I was younger on the phone loud, tried to make out what's being said in there. But you could tell it's George Martin. And he's having a conversation with someone about something. I'm truly sorry. It's a bitch. I thought it was George yes. Harrison yes. talking to. Could be. Could be. I think it's George Martin. But I have. Uh, no, well, I think it is George Martin in there, but maybe he is talking to George Harrison. Yes. yes hmm. um, I have a question, uh, yeah. a logistical question. We're here at the beginning now. The Moog was invented, um, the first one, they, 1964. The beginnings of it by within five years, the Rolling Stones have their hands on one. George Harrison has their hands on uh, his hands on one. And the one we were talking about being in L.A. in the Jackie Lomax right. session. Um, and, and in reading your book, you're talking about um, so they were traveling around with the with their synthesizer, but they're setting it up. And I'm like, having seen pictures of the setup there, how could you travel around with this thing? Can you tell us about? The logistics <laughs> of having a Moog in the late 60s. Well, okay. It's interesting. You know, he had two different types of models and he had one, he had, you know, the one, well, he had the one, the two and the three, um, you know, these were the modulars and the one was like the sort of entry level bare bones model. And then the two had more modules and the three was sort of like, you know, all the fixings, you know, it had everything. Uh, and so it all went up in, in price. It was um, on a sliding scale. So um, at some point he decided to do P versions, the letter P. So there's the 1P, the 2P, and the 3P, and the P stands for portable. And so these were actually in cases, so you could set them up. And the best view of that that I can think of, that you can see, uh, there's a picture of it in my book, but, but there's a, um, a wonderful video of the monkeys um, doing um, uh, Daily Nightly, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's with Mickey Dolenz, who was actually the first uh, rocker to actually purchase one in September of 1967, and then they used it on uh, um, that music video for Daily Nightly, which aired for the first time in early 68, and you can see it's set up, and it looks like three shallow sort of little suitcases uh, all placed out, um, you know, sort of on a table. So you could take those around. They were portable in that sense, but you had to buy those portable models. And this is before the mini mug, of course, you know, which was, uh, you know, totally compact. So like any other gear, you know, I think it just depends. I mean, if you're on tour, you'd have, you probably have amps and all sorts of gear, right, that you would be taking with you. So this was just more gear, you know. Uh, Keith Emerson, of course, got into uh, taking his monster mug around and that thing was very unwieldy <laughs> but you know it was part of his act so Keith yeah Emerson on the top yeah 
And then Rick Wakeman with six uh, mini mugs uh, in the picture in the middle there <laughs> on stage. King Arthur on ice, you know, on his his tour. But uh, yeah, no, that that's a that's a really good question. I mean, I, it doesn't seem like something that would be portable, but it was uh, to a certain extent portable. You know? You're talking about like when they were trying to get it through customs. When I think it was one of the Rolling Stones, and uh, the customs are going through the. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on a second. They would <laughs> have to probably shut down the whole terminal to unpack all this stuff. <laughs> and who's the lucky guy who got had to put it all back then? <laughs> Well, it was probably, I mean, the, George, um, okay, so, uh, oh, the, you're talking about the Stones. Yeah. I believe that's with the, that, that was when they were figured, uh, this isn't, uh, they probably was, had drugs. Drugs were them. hidden in there. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was probably just, you know, three cabinets with modules, you know, so it's probably not that huge, you know, it, it, it just depends on how much equipment. I, I don't exactly know in the case of Mick Jagger exactly which model he ordered. Uh, maybe in the book, I just don't remember offhand, but it might be a, a 3P. In the case of, of George Harrison, he had four units because he had the, he had the uh, sequencer complement too. So the illustration on the front of electronic sound uh, that George did uh, with, with Bernie and the, with a green face, you see four units behind him and those were George's four units. Um, and uh, you, you can also see those set up in the um, uh, for the Abbey Road sessions, uh, the famous pictures. I have two of them in the book, you know, one with uh, a close up of uh, Paul and one with a close up of uh, John. Um, but you can kind of see them laid out. So, uh, you know, and that was, uh, you know, I guess fairly early on, 69. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. He's ready. <laughs> so. Yeah, it was, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, huge. I mean, you know, it was it fit on a table, basically, you know, something like that. So it was probably four units uh, when, when they brought it in to, uh, to Heathrow for, um, for uh, Mick Jagger. So one of the things that your book does is that it talks about the artists before the Beatles that use the Moog. And you just mentioned the Monkees. And yeah. Um, yeah. they or also used it on Star Collector. Oh Although yeah, I, yeah. I I think Mickey didn't play it on on that song. You no, know, I think that was that was Paul Beaver because it was a little more complex. You know, yeah. Paul Beaver did so many of those sessions. Um, yeah, and I guess I guess it got to the Beatles basically through um, uh, uh, through Mickey Dolenz because you know the Beatles hung out so much with uh, with the Monkees, and I guess it was uh, you know that that famous thing that uh, you know Mickey Dolenz said that when uh, John got hold of the Moog one night, you know he sat making flying saucer sounds, you know, for hours, you know, so he was really fascinated with it. But ironically, he was the one who uh, I guess of the four of them really did the least with it. You know, I mean, if you sort of trace it through af after Abbey Road, you know, it seems that. George used it the most, um, and then, um, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, Paul used it the most because he also had the mini mug as well, and then George uh, had one, so he had that. And then um, I noticed that uh, uh, John, just a tiny bit on a few albums, uh, and then um, Ringo, but I'm not sure it was the Mo. You know, at a certain point, those those later albums, Wings and their solo albums. Uh, they so many of them say synthesizer, uh, you know, under the personnel or synthesizers, uh, right. guitar synthesizer, sometimes bass synthesizer. Um, but at a certain point, uh, I find that uh, unless it specifies mini Moog, it often says synthesizers. And I know there's ARP on something as well. Mm. I've seen that mm -hmm. as well. So once they really got into the synth sound, I think that they moved sort of beyond Moog. I mean, a lot of people did that too. You know, I was always disappointed to find out that Elton John on the, you know, Funeral for a Friend, that fantastic opening is so mm. great. And it's an ARP. Yeah, it's not a Moog. What a shame. You know, I was hoping it was a Moog. <laughs> You know, Elton, it seemed to be mostly an art person. You know, I think the only Moog I found on any of his albums is on his um, eponymous first Elton John uh, yeah. album. And it's on one song and it credits a woman playing the Moog. And I think that may be it for Elton John, even though uh, the Moog, uh, one of the iterations of the Moog company used Elton John in his picture to advertise one of their uh, one of their products. And actually the Radio Shack 
uh, MG1 Moog, which Bob Moog had nothing to do with and hated, you know, and sold more than any other Moog synthesizers in history. You know, they had Elton John's picture in the Radio Shack catalog two years in a row, 82 and 83, with the Moog, but he never really, you know, cared to use one. <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. So do you know with something like, say, Band on the Run, the song, mm -hmm. or Zoo Gang, which has the same sound, is that a Moog or is that an ARP? Or can you can you tell by your ears by listening sometimes? Uh, the, uh, not really. I, I mean, I have to, to admit, um, uh, I have, uh, let me just, uh, when you mentioned Band on the Run, okay, so... Um, it should okay. be a mini Moog because Linda had one by then. I th I I think it is, and, and, and um, I I doubt that the studio in Lagos would have actually been equipped. They were they recorded that in Nigeria, um, and the the studio barely had functioning multi tracks, so they probably didn't have a Moog. Right. No, I think I think I'm just checking uh, some notes here that I have. Yes, Band on the Run uh, uh, definitely has uh, Linda McCartney listed on keyboards. Uh, um yeah just on keyboards i find a lot of the time she's listed not specifically as as moog but um mm. yeah that that probably would have been her definitely and i remember george harrison's extra texture album in the credits they would list the arp a few times and that might have been this is this is from my memory here but i think that's gary wright can you tell like from gary wright dream weaver dream weaver is mm. that what kind of synthesizer is that is that i'm okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> I, I, I don't know you know it, it, i mean i'm a musician and i have pretty decent ears but after all of this i have to say maybe i've been inundated with too much synth sound over the years you know it's like uh, i don't know i'm sort of asking a violinist maybe you know can you tell a stradivari when you hear it from a guarnieri or something i i don't know maybe an american <laughs> steinway in a german steinway or a steinway in a beck <laughs> <laughs> exactly i don't know i mean i i hate to say it i mean i I know that when they when the ARP first came out, it had this kind of clean sound, and um, and the Moog was a little dirtier. But the problem is now with so many um, soft synths, you know, and uh, digital audio workstations, and so many things, you know, we, we're so inundated with synth sounds now, you know, to try and isolate Moog and and even the newer Moogs, you know, that that the company is coming out with, you know, there's so many possibilities that it it's it's just hard to say. I think you know. I often have to to see somebody playing one on stage to sort of know for sure, you know. But you 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 mentioned uh, extra texture, yeah. Uh, that uh, yeah was credited Moog and Arp both apparently. Okay, good on that. Um, McCarthy so, uh, got involved with uh, Moog through exactly the same way and the same place, as George. Um, he was working at Sound Recorders in LA on RAM. And uh, the people at Sound Recorders obviously knew how to get in touch with Paul Beaver. They had Paul Beaver come along with a few modules um, because he wanted to do things like have, you know, special effects on Uncle Albert and, uh, and, and a couple of other things. And Paul Beaver came and demonstrated all this stuff. And then he came a second day and they actually did the processing that he wanted. Um, and Paul, unlike George, didn't immediately buy a Moog, but um, eventually um, he got a mini Moog for Linda. And not that much after that, when did the mini Moog come out? Uh, well, the first production model came off uh, the line in late November of 1970, but they weren't really selling them until 71. Right. Uh, and it started out very slowly. So probably by mid to late 71, you could get your hands on one. Yeah. Uh, so hers was not that much later than that. And, um, and she used it on... Red Rose Speedway. Uh, there's this song called Loop, the first Indian on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, that was basically the first day she brought it into the studio and they were just making sounds and messing around and, uh, and, and then that, that song song piece came out of it. And, um, I think one of the reasons that Glenn Johns quit as producer, I mean, there were a number of reasons he, he didn't like the fact that they were getting high and, you know, all of that stuff. And he, he felt they were just sort of 
messing around and and he's he's a producer who i mean he had just done the first eagles album and who's next and he was used to people really focused on their sessions and that's not necessarily the way paul always worked so he ended up leaving but loop was sort of a, a cause um of anxiety for him because he didn't think they were really doing anything just getting these weird sounds that he felt you know they're into this because they're high <laughs> but um yeah so and then they you know they toured with the mini moog and um later on there are a number of things i, I just finished writing for volume two the the uh, venus and mars stuff and uh there are places where Linda plays it, but there are also places where Paul plays uh, the Moog as well. And when they say Moog on the on the session sheets, I'm assuming it's the mini Moog because it's what they had. Yeah, I, fi I find, I don't know, I, I think, I don't know if you'd agree with this, that um, as time goes on in the 70s, I find that um, their use on their different albums, well, especially, especially Paul, um, uh, the use of synthesizers becomes more kind of just ingrained in the overall sound. You know, if you look at the personnel list, you, you know, it, it can be huge. And somewhere in there, somebody, you know, is playing three different instruments and one of them is synthesizers, you know, sort of varied in the sound. And then um, I think it was, I'm trying to think now, is it a, um, it might even be a, um, a Ringo album that where, somebody admitted that the um the horn and brass sounds were really just a synthesizer that wasn't they weren't live sounds you know so they were doing a lot of that i think too so i don't i don't know it just seems like a synthesizer if stevie wonder is actually on i'm trying to remember what it is he's on some uh later period album well maybe not later period i'm trying to think what that is playing synthesizer mm -hmm. i think it's one of paul's um Pretty sure. I wonder if I'm talking of war, but I don't know. I think that's what I'm thinking of. <clears throat> yeah. So, Ebony and Ivory, or What's That You're Doing, those two songs. What's you know? That You're Doing, What's That You're Doing has kind of like little um, mm -hmm. effects on it that sound yeah. like they would probably have been created on the Moog. Um, the story, Bob Moog's story has a dark side to it which I found interesting and in a nutshell, how poor of a businessman he was. And you're talking about all of these different models, uh, which I didn't know any of this, uh, but a lot of these inventions of his, he didn't have patents for them. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, the, the problem is he had one patent. Uh, he was he was uh, listed on a number of patents, uh, uh, sort of co-listed with other people, uh, but they weren't really his patents. It was more you know, he was just sort of uh, part of a company, and the company was uh, you know when he was bought out was um, uh, issuing a lot of patents for various things, and his name went on along with the engineer who really probably invented it. His really one and only patent was was his ladder filter, which is responsible for that sort of fat Moog bass sound, that sort of fat low buzz that's, uh, you know, that's uh, one of the characteristic Moog sounds and the ladder filter was um, was responsible for that. And uh, the problem is, though, that, uh, you know, he never had the money to take out a lot of patents because it was expensive to file. And, you know, he was he was really de desperate financially. But the problem also is that the synthesizer, like I guess a lot of inventions, is made up of components that are already patented, you know. So to to put the whole thing together and patent it, it wasn't something he was really able to do. And he just, he, he didn't really have that business sense either. You know, it was very difficult. And he had patent battles with, with ARP actually, uh, you know, over a couple of things at one point, you know, but uh, no, he really, uh, really didn't have any patents to his name that he could have enforced particularly, except the ladder filter and ARP stole that too. Uh, and put it in the Odyssey and, and quite a quite a few of their instruments, the the twenty six hundred and all of that. Until um, finally, what happened was the uh, Moog people one day were I tell the story in the book. They were um, listening to I think it was an ARP Odyssey or twenty six hundred, and they said that sounds an awful lot like the Moog filter. And so they had one of the guys. Uh, they actually asked him to take an ice pick and crack into this. Uh, um, 
shell that had been built that are built around the filter to sort of shield it and when he broke into it they they said yep that's it that's bob's ladder filter so they were going to sue arp and and it it never really made it to court and they kind of settled and uh but uh many of those early arps quite a few of them have that ladder filter and then arp had to had to come up with their own filter design it was kind of inferior but that was rather late in the game you know so uh you know the art that you hear in um, uh, the, the famous tune uh, in um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that probably has a, still has a Moog filter that 1977, something that was like the borderline, 76, 77, they started to take out, uh, they, they no longer could use Bob's uh, filter, but that was really his only patent. Wow. Uh, it's amazing. Well, I mean, this the story of Bob Moogs is, is, is such a, a, a mystery to most people because you would think that he was like, a, you know, AT&T or, you know, Bell Labs or, uh, you know, Microsoft or something, but he really wasn't. <laughs> when was you talk of, about the filter for the for that fat bass sound. Yeah. Um, Simon and Garfunkel had their their record, uh, Save the Life of My Child, mm -hmm. which starts off with that very sound. Is that the filter that was used for that? Was it used uh, in it? Yeah, probably. Uh, I tell the story in the book about how uh, Bob was in on that session and a uh, electric bass player came through the studio and saw them doing that on the uh, uh, on the synth and uh, it had a kind of a sliding effect that you couldn't uh, apparently really do on a real electric bass and uh, Bob, you know, tells the story that the, the bass player turned white, you know, <laughs> he saw that it was just, you know, he's so, uh, you know, intimidated by that. So uh, probably, uh, I'm trying to recall the song now, you know, exactly the, the sound, but the, it's that sort of very low buzzing, uh, you know, effect, very, very low. Right. Uh, but that's one of the characteristics of the ladder filter. So um, definitely uh, when you hear Moog, uh, you can tell that that's a Moog usually. But again, nowadays, you know, soft synths and everything, you know, <laughs> I'm sure they've imitated that sound and, you know, so it's, it's hard to know. But, uh, and there was also, of course, the, the uh, American Federation, the, uh, you know, musicians, the union issue, of course, was huge in imitating, right. uh, you yeah. know, that I talk about that a lot in the book, you know, because that was uh, being used for that. So the question always came down to it for a lot of, I think, a lot of rock musicians, are you using the synth as a synth to have a pure sound that sounds like a synth, or are you using it to uh, create a string section because you don't want to hire a string section, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, and um, uh, Keith Emerson always said he used a synth to sound like a synth. He didn't want it to sound like anything else. And um, Stevie Wonder also, I think, really uh, played upon synth sounds, to distinguish them from all the other instruments, you know. Uh, but there were some people who just wanted to, you know, uh, imitate traditional instruments. That's so right. you know, that was a, could could be a real problem. I think all the sounds that they use on Abbey Road are are really pure synth sounds. There's nothing that's that's sort of an imitation. Uh, oh, oh, definitely, definitely, yes. That sort of uh, fluty sound that uh, uh, Paul gets on Maxwell's Silver Hammer is very, you know, is is wonderful, and in um, uh, uh, here comes the sun, uh, you know, there's sort of, uh, brass like sounds in the middle section, but, uh, but even there, you know, you can tell it's not really brass, you know, it has a different type of sound. Yeah. So I think they really prized it for that. And then and John the gurgling just sounds. I'm sorry, Alan. I'm sorry. I was just saying, John, just using white noise. Um, you don't get any less instrumental than that. <laughs> But you know what, what what I learned in writing this book, which I was so interesting, is that they also took uh, out of the cabinet at the studio a wind machine, and he wanted both of them used. So when you hear that rushing wind sound at the end of the song, it gets cut off, you know, with the song. It's hard to know what part of that is the wind machine, you know, which, uh, uh, you know, Strauss, Richard Strauss used in his symphonies, you know, that wind sound for storms and everything, and which is the Moog, you know, it's hard to know. So it just seemed like at that point, John was just piling it on and piling it on, like he was having a fit, and he just said, I want this to overwhelm everything, and maybe the Moog couldn't 
make enough wind sound for him. So they got out the actual wind machine and used that too. And it just created this sense. So that actual cut for me is kind of like the, the, the not the best example of how they used it, uh, much more so in, in, in the other three songs, I think, you know. Especially Maxwell's Silver Hammer, I find that, you know, it's, uh, you know, it really takes on, you can hear the slides, you know, the portamento and all of that. So I thought it was very creative use there, really neat. And, and I, the, gurg the gurgling sounds on, uh, uh, is it Sun, Sun King or the crickets coming in and that's, is that, that's all the Moog too, is it not? The crickets, the now, I, yeah. No, I don't think so, because uh, no, because it was only used on four cuts in Abbey Road, for sure. So that must have been, uh, could have been ambient crickets or something like that, or some other effect. Uh, I've never Tape heard library? The uh, yeah. library? The library? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure. I mean, there, there must be. Could I just read something here? I got a quote from Alan Parsons about what yeah. Paul played on Maxwell Silver Hammer. He said the notes were not from the keyboard. He did that with a continuous ribbon slide thing, just moving his finger up and down on an endless ribbon. It's very difficult to find the right notes, rather like a violin, but Paul picked it up straight away. He can pick up anything musical in a couple of days. So is that kind of like what you were describing with the electrotheremin? Exactly. Yeah, it's it's the ribbon controller, which was actually um, uh, an add-on that you could get. It was a controller that Bob sold at a certain point, but the very first one uh, that was really actively used was done for the Beach Boys uh, when they went on tour. He called it a, a Melsonar, but the ribbon controller was uh, pretty standard for people at a certain point because it did allow you to do that. And yes, you can hear that. And, and it is pretty amazing because when Mike Love, um, they were just making that effect actually on um, on good vibrations, but they actually took a grease pencil. It was Walter Sear who so, sold him the original unit um, and uh, they took a grease pencil to mark off where the notes were because it's just a continuous slide. So where do you put your fingers, you know, where do you yeah. find those? So that's pretty amazing. And what Paul did was uh, I think on Maxwell Silver Hammer, much more creative than what they were doing in, in Good Vibrations. Good Vibrations was just a, you know, vibration sound I, they wanted, you know, to characterize that. But but um, that is that is amazing that he did pick it up that quickly, I guess. I never I never gave it any thought, but yeah, it wouldn't be that easy to do. Just like a regular theremin. I mean, you can miscalculate so easy and overshoot on notes and all mm. of that. I don't know how many takes it would have taken for him to get that, but it was, it, it's a really, it's a wonderful effect. I, I love it on that song. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. I'm sure that's I'm sure that's a very accurate description. That's fantastic. It's interesting that, that Paul also played uh the mini Moog, I guess, on uh, you know, on on several albums here and there, you know, in addition to Linda. Well, there's a there's a video, I'm trying to think which song it is now. I sh I should know this. Um uh, a video that starts out with Paul doing this this wonderful bass on the mini Moog. It's a close up of his hand, it's wings, I believe. Arrow Through Me is a song, you know, that there's there's no real bass on there, but he's using a synthesizer for that. Uh, you know, it's really neat. It's a wonderful example of him playing the mini Moog. I mean, I would, you know, definitely recommend that to someone as, as uh, something, you know, if they said, well, what's an example of Paul McCartney, you know, using a synthesizer that was, you know, it's, it's an official music video. So whatever it is, it's not just a live concert. It's actually the official music video. It, it might be arrow through me. Yeah, I'm pulling it up here and seeing. It's playing the keyboard. Yes, I believe that's it. That's arrow, arrow through me. Through me. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just thought that was, I, I love that. I thought the fact that it was an official music video and they left it in, you know, with his fingers kind of dancing over the mini mobs. Yeah, right? he's, playing, he's playing it through the video also, you know, for oh, a yeah. novice like me who doesn't, play any instruments i'm just assuming he's got like he's playing a you know i don't know any basic synth and not thinking about the specifics of it until now yeah yeah okay there's a video which i would recommend maybe i'll get the link for it but um of here comes the sun and what george harrison plays on on the moog and at the same time you hear the orchestration that George Martin did for it mixed with that. And oh. the only other thing are hand claps 
in the song and it's fascinating oh, when you wow, just have those, those tracks isolated and combined it's really it's gorgeous <laughs> i would love uh, to see that you you had mentioned um about and and in the book several times of of, of bob moog's encounters with rock groups and rock sessions and how basically horrified he was um do you have any idea what he felt about the beatles as such um not specifically i don't think he talked about it too much i'm i'm sure he was thrilled i he was very excited the person that he usually talked about the most was keith emerson but that was because emerson was inviting him to his live concerts and you know was buying new equipment constantly and 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 you know he had his monster moog and they were constantly sending out people to service um uh the monster moog on tour all over the world and this kind of thing so keith was very connected um, I, I get the impression that, uh, well, in the case of Abbey Road, you know, that was kind of a, a one shot. And then afterwards, when the four of them went off, I guess it was more like they bought equipment, but maybe weren't necessarily in contact with Bob as much, you know, and he, he tended to talk more about the people that he was constantly in contact with, you know, so like, I never really heard any comments he made on the doors, particularly, or the birds, or, you know, the very, I'm just thinking of the other groups that, that uh, you know, used his, uh, his instruments. So, I mean, he loved Jan Hammer, uh, you know, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, uh, because he loved his, um, his mi sort of mini mode virtuosity, but he didn't, I don't know, he commented, uh, there's, there's a great, um, there's a great article uh, where Bob, uh, this was in the, when was it in the 90s i think when he kind of sounds off on a lot of albums and a lot of groups and that kind of thing and i guess uh, i should go back and check but um i don't think he necessarily talked about the beatles particularly uh i think had he met them in person or any one of them then i think maybe you know there might have been more of a personal connection there uh but i but i'm sure he was really uh, uh, really excited. It was actually the article was in the Guardian. I, I'm realizing now, and it was called. Um, I think it was called. Um, I wouldn't call that music. <laughs> that was Bob sort of sounding off on all these different albums. You know, his taste was very strange. I have to say, there is a, a whole episode I talk about in the book in which he um, he basically it was interviewed by the New York Times, and he was going on about how all these awful albums were coming out with his name attached to them you know everything was switched on after after switched on Bach with Wendy Carlos in 1968 then you had you know probably you know 50 switched on albums you know, switched on country Nashville gold you know switched on Gershwin and switched on this and switched on that and it was just you know everything with a Moog and he was so disgusted but there were some decent albums in there too and um, he wasn't willing to really praised him. The only one that he praised was Gershon Kingsley's music to Moog by, which I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I would call that music <laughs> some of it maybe, but that's what he kind of touted, you know, in the New York Times and, and his friend and uh, business uh, associate, Walter Sear, who actually put out a whole album of music on the Moog. He wasn't listed among Bob's favorites and he was his friend, you know, and, and Sear was furious, you know, because, you know, he went to all that trouble. He was also trying to sell uh, units, you know, sell modulars, and he felt that these albums, you know, got the word out about the synthesizer. And so Bob, when he when he weighed in about music, it was very very strange. I I don't, I don't always trust his his opinion, but I, I I think in the end he must have been really thrilled that 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 rockers were using it. You know, mm. I want to uh, I, bring. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. No, I want to bring up something out of left field here because um, uh, about. Is it a month now? Almost a month ago, we did a, a 90th birthday tribute to Yoko Ono here on on Things We Said Today. And we had as one of our guests, Dan Richter, who was uh, who was an assistant uh, working with John and Yoko uh, from the very late 60s mm. to about what was it, 70, 71 or two. Mm -hmm. um, he worked. Um, and I remember in preparing for that show, it blew my mind. When I was reading about Dan Richter, that Dan played one of the apes at the beginning of 2001, A Space Odyssey. He was into mime and Stanley Kubrick, uh, I guess, brought Dan in, knew him somehow, knew this mime troupe and wanted him to handle 
the scene, the dawn of man at the beginning of the movie. And while we're doing the Yoko show, I keep looking at Dan Richter thinking <laughs> he was one of the apes in 2001. The space Odyssey, how cool is this? Which piqued my curiosity again uh, for uh, the movie, which I haven't seen in eons and always found it both intriguing and so difficult to, to get in there and figure what was going on. So the other night, um, I, I watched it for the first time in ages. I, I I put it on too late at night. I kind of couldn't stay awake for the whole thing. But has me now wondering here, did the Moog play a role in any of the effects, whether the music or the sound effects in the film, on anything having to do with 2001 A Space Odyssey? I never found any evidence for that um, at all. There, there's a there's a recording of um, music from 2001: Space Odyssey that was put out in late 1968, um, right around the time that um, Switched on Bach came out, and it is a uh, Philadelphia Orchestra, I believe, one of the major orchestras doing you know music the classical music excerpts, and it's got um, Morton Subotnick on it, uh, adding in effects on the Buchla synthesizer, you know, as sort of transitional <laughs> places between, you know, the classical selections. But as far as I know, uh, Moog was never used in any way for any effects or anything like that. Because now as we're talking about it, I'm thinking about the movie, and I'm like, there has to be some use of this, but I guess not. Well, you know that um, in the book, I talk about how uh, Leonard Bernstein in, in one of his um, uh, uh, young people's concerts, uh, you know, presented the Moog to mm -hmm. the children. And I, I in, even, uh, you know, entitled um, uh, one of the chapters, Hello, Hal, you know, <laughs> because he tries to make the connection for the kids between the blinking lights and all of that. And this, uh, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, cabin, uh, uh, the uh, 747 cockpit look of this thing, you know, for these kids, uh, you know, in 1969 to get them to understand what this was all about. You know, so he used that as an analogy, but he never spoke about any connection between that and the film. So I, I don't know. I, I, uh, uh, the main film that really, the one that is outstanding for me is Apocalypse Now, you know, with the Moog. I mean, that, that was really huge. Uh, so oh, okay one of my and, old favorite films yeah yeah i mean that's that's uh one of the reasons for having uh coppola uh, write the foreword of course to the book you know because it's a sort of draw that in because it was so iconic in that film you know the use of the moog so uh and carmine coppola's score is wonderful in the fact that they kind of uh, took what was an orchestral score and rescored it for synthesizers you know so it was really uh, it was a fascinating process and the clock of orange of course it was sort of the uh say switched on bach approach where you were just written for classical instruments and became synthesizer well i i think i think i think it, it, they're they're similar except the the process was a little different uh, the 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 in switched on bach she just uh, she essentially arranged made a multi-track arrangements of the original like brandenburg concertos and that kind of thing uh on different tracks but she had to play in every single line individually uh, and the instrument at that point, the Moog was going out of tune, the oscillators were drifting constantly. So, you know, it was very, very difficult for her to get a clean take. So um, she compares it, I mentioned this in the book, to like putting together a, a Disney an animation frame by frame, you know, I mean, uh, pasting together all these scraps to get this sense of all, you know, the synthesizer, which was monophonic, essentially, you know, played one note at a time, uh, and you could change the sounds constantly. She had to overdub and overdub and overdub this, you know, stratified uh, all these layers to get the effect of the counterpoint of Bach. Um, with um, with Apocalypse Now, Carmine Coppola, you know, um, uh, Francis Coppola's father, uh, was a classical, classically trained composer and uh, and flutist uh, who played with the NBC Symphony, and, and his experience was really in writing, you know, standard soundtrack scores. So he started out by doing that, and he really didn't know the synthesizer at all. And then there were these four synthesists who were hired uh, to be on the project, and. Um, it was it was really quite a process uh, that they had to do to sync it up with the film, but they gave the material 
to these synthesis and ask them to take the original score and kind of translate it into synthesized sound. And so that's kind of, and they were working in teams and it was very, very complex. So, but the original started out that way. My, my favorite part, um, a musical part of that whole film is the final scene uh, because it really sounds like an orchestra that's been sort of like submerged underwater or something or, you know, it's supposed to be sort of like a drug-laced vision of something, the way you might hear an orchestra if you were on drugs so that, you know, there's this kind of distortion. So you can kind of hear strings, but not really, kind of hear a trumpet, but not really. So that was one of the advantages, I think, of, of using a Moog, is that you could kind of, in the same way as switched on Bach, you could sort of replicate the sound of instruments, but it wasn't really the actual instruments, you know, sort of uh, cherry lifesavers and not cherry cherries, but you might still like cherry lifesavers on their own, you know, I don't know, that kind of thing, I guess. <laughs> The first film that used um, the, the that I'm aware of that used the um, uh, Moog was The Trip uh, from 1967, which was sort of the prequel in some ways to Easy Rider. Uh, it was a Roger right. Corman yeah. film. Uh, uh, so that uh, so by '67 it was being used in film, and it, it was used in other films. So by I, I'm assuming that um, if it came out. 2001 came out in 68, right? So probably it would have been filmed in around 67. So those were the early days. But Paul Beaver, you know, speaking of Paul Beaver, he did a lot of effects all through the 1950s in film scores using electronic devices that he invented himself and all sorts of things, you know. So there's so many things. And of course, uh, Forbidden Planet. I don't know if any of you know Forbidden Planet. I've heard of uh, it, too. Oh, that's an unbelievable story. I I, I wasn't able to, to find enough uh, real estate in the book to really talk about it a lot, so I put it into an end note. But it but it is there. It's a fascinating story about this this couple in Greenwich Village who um, created these um, circuits that would die. So they were sort of like um, almost like living creatures, biological creatures. They had a lifespan, and as they were dying and expiring, they would film them. I not film them, I'm sorry. They would record them, because uh, they had an early tape recorder, early 1950s, and they recorded these things, and that became the score for Forbidden Planet, which 1956, which I think is one of the first sort of all electronic sci-fi scores. And so you could listen to that and think, gee, could that be a Moog? But in 1956, there was no Moog synthesizers. So um, mm. that was just all electronic circuits and things. So there's so many things that can be done, I think, without using a synthesizer. One of the big mysteries in the book is like, Okay, you've got at this time in the early 70s, you've got, um, okay, you know, the Beatles had used it, the Stones had used it, the monkeys and the birds. And uh, then you have these sort of groups like Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer who have this, the synthesizer as the, basically the centerpiece of their of their setup. Everybody is using it. It's in films. And yet he's living hand to mouth. Why yeah. is that? Yeah. Well, the the problem is that he was the first one out in the field. I mean, he really started the commercial synthesizer business, and uh, he didn't know what he was what he what was involved, what he was in for. So he produced a product. Everyone wanted it, but then when he started to buy supplies and hire a staff. Uh, and have the overhead and all of that, he realized that it was very, very expensive to produce these things and you could only charge so much. And uh, by the time he got to the point, his peak year was 1969. It was huge, you know, just as um, as Abbey Road was coming out and all that, he had 42 employees. He was he was it was going strong, but then the demand became too strong and he couldn't fulfill orders and he fell behind on orders. And just as that was happening, then he had all this competition coming in uh, in 1970 ARP was formed and then you had ARP and he had quite a few competitors coming in. And then once uh, about 1972, you had the Japanese market for synthesizers too. And so they also uh, um, uh, 
uh, uh, one of the Japanese manufacturers stole his um, uh, ladder filter too and put it in one of their instruments and there was nothing he could do about it. It was an international thing. So um, he was just kind of never able to stay on top of what he was doing and he could never have the, the capital and raise the capital to be able to stay ahead of things. You know, I mean, that it, it is such an irony. I talk about that in the book, you know, the, the people who did ads made so much money from this thing it was unbelievable that the the best example is Mort Garson who was a you know a, sort of a Hollywood composer and uh, he he had a he had his own Moog and he talks about how there was an ad guy who came and uh, the, he just wanted one note on the Moog and um, Mort Garson was paid uh, twenty thousand dollars for the commercial and and this was you know we're talking 1960s you know so for that one note you know <laughs> And, and Bob had trouble, you know, uh, they had to wait till the end of the month to pay for his daughter's dance lessons, you know, sort of, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So it was very, very difficult. He was, yeah, that, that is one of the great ironies of his life. And people say he was a bad businessman, but I think he also, a lot of it was out of his control. You know, he just, it got away from him. It was very hard. And I think another problem is that people just, a lot of people, a lot of investors didn't really understand what a synthesizer was. He tried to raise money a lot of times and people just said, well, I don't really get it. You know? So I think that was the problem. Was he bitter about this? Um, well, yes and no. I think, I, you know, Bob was the sort of person who, uh, you know, the thing that made him happiest was just, uh, you know, going down a rabbit hole with some musician to create some new kind of instrument. And all of the financial stuff just kind of went over his head. And he kept using the, his family's financial resources, his wife's inheritance, his own inheritance, you know, selling off property, blew through everything. And uh, I, I don't know if I would call him bitter. I think I, I, I never knew him to be that way. I, I think he just kind of felt that was kind of uh, uh, the way things were. I mean, he was able to, you know, maintain a certain financial stability, but he just never made a big, huge, you know, and a huge profit, you know. So mm -hmm. he was very sanguine about things. It was, it was such a nice, I don't know, there was just something about Bob that was so even-tempered, you know. I mean, he, he only usually lost it occasionally, like if uh, there were so many instruments that carry the Moog name that he had nothing to do with. <laughs> I, I often come upon that, you know, says, oh, yes, Moog, he wrote his biography. I love that Poly Moog, you know, thinking, well, okay, he hated the Poly Moog, you know, because the company that took his name, you know, when he was bought out, made this, this polyphonic thing, and he hated it, you know, and he was forced to endorse it, actually, you know, in ads and things like that for the company while he was still working for them. But he, he hated that instrument. So it's not really a Moog instrument, you know, so there are so many things. In the index of my book, I have a whole section on instruments and equipment with a Moog name not made by or with Bob Moog. And it's quite a long list. And I have a feeling a lot of people may very be very disappointed to see that, you know. But uh, the Beatles, I think for the most part, um, used, uh, from what I can tell, uh, you know, either the modulars or the or the mini Moog. There is a poly Moog on somebody's album later on, and I'm trying to remember it was somebody who put had a poly Moog in there. But I, I do find that so often they're just listed as synthesizer or synthesizers. So it's mm -hmm. hard to know unless it's specifically listed in, in Wings as as Linda McCartney or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain when you say that Bob was the first one to have a commercial synthesizer? Um, what was the Mellotron? Wasn't that a synthesizer in a way? Well, not by the same definition. I, I, I see the Mellotron as being closer to like sound effects records that are like on tape loops, you know, where you can press a button and, and you get a, it was the first sampler, really, I guess, you know, I mean, uh -huh. uh, Hardcore people, uh, even today, I think, would distinguish between samplers and uh, synthesizers because, you know, a sample sound, obviously, with a Mellotron, it wasn't digital, but it was a sound sample, right, of a flute or, uh, you know, an acoustic instrument. So it was a way to produce and imitate musical instruments. But that was one of the things that that just dogged Bob his whole life, this, this whole question with the musician's union, are you replacing instrumentalists are you replacing uh, acoustic instruments and he tried as much as he could to say that a true synthesizer makes uh, you know a world of sounds and it can sound like a flute or it can sound like a violin but that was not the purpose of it you know it's not why it was used so the mellotron i find is more 
to have the feeling of these actual instruments as opposed to creating white noise or the sound of breaking glass or you know a waterfall or something like that the synthesizer is just so varied in what it can do you know hmm. but it synthesizes sounds from from parts that you put together and it's kind of an open-ended um, design, you know, open-ended architecture, so you can pull from this and that and put it all together. Whereas the Mellotron is pretty set, right? I mean, it's you know, it's pretty. What what you have is what you get. I think it's there was also an issue with the musicians' unions with the Mellotron because the Mellotron uses recorded tape, yeah. and the recordings on the actual tapes that got into like a sticky situation of you're using a recording of some body theoretically right playing right. a note or whatever and manipulating it then in the mellotron yeah no i'm sure that must have must have caused problems too i think the problem with the synthesizer was that it was now seen as something that could really uh kind of take over <laughs> Right. You could do string sections, brass sections, you could do uh, just about anything, percussive sounds, uh, you know, it was just sort of limitless. And you right. could mix those all in with sounds that were not like acoustic instruments. So it was just this whole thing that could be done completely without any humans except one person. <laughs> now, one other instrument I just want to bring up is the, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, claviolin. Okay. Okay, because the Beatles used that on Baby You're a Rich Man, and I thought that was supposed to be a synthesizer too. Well, there were there were a number. There's also the Andiolin, also, which was uh, used a lot during that time period. There were a number of instruments that were electronic instruments that produced electronic tones with oscillators. Um, but I think the main difference is that most of them had a limited sound palette. So in other words, um, you know, the, like the Hammond organ is a perfect example, or the Novacord, the Hammond Novacord. Mm -hmm. These are instruments that do produce tones electronically and, and can sound like acoustic instruments, but they have sort of a limited vocabulary of what they can do. You know, there's a certain range of sounds. Um, so the clavulin, the ambulin, those types of instruments, uh, yes, they existed uh, and they could be used, but they didn't have the range of sound. The, the, the synthesizer is really, again, like an open end. It's not really an instrument. It's sort of like a, I don't know, like a giant uh, kitchen with every possible ingredient you could possibly want, you know, and uh -huh. you could make anything with these ingredients, you know, it's limitless. Whereas maybe the, the, the clavulin and the ondulin are more like instruments that, you know, you have 25 ingredients and you can kind of combine them in certain ways, but that, that's what you've got, you know? So um, a lot of people use those instruments. I mean, there was something called the um, electronic sack butt that goes back to the 1940s, you know, that was Hugh LeCain's invention. He was a Canadian engineer. And that was, you know, that also could do an awful lot of the things that we hear the Moog do. You know, a lot of these early instruments were considered, uh, you know, sort of like synthesizers, but again, you know, you could only do a certain range of sound. So the revolution that Bob really started was this open architecture of, you know, you can make any sounds if you know how to manipulate the equipment. So I think the Beatles were were moving toward that very much. I mean, you know, a, a day in the life, revolution number nine, um, George, uh, you know, with um, uh, go, going all the way back to uh, his first use of the uh, uh, of the sitar and then, uh, you know, Wonderwall music and all of that and then electronic sound on his own, you know, all these things. They were sort of moving in that direction very much of having that freedom. So probably something like the um, Minimoog, I'm guessing, was also kind of a revelation maybe to Paul because it was easier to control than, you know, all the, you know, plugs and everything you needed for the big modulars and you could move it around but you could get a, a lot of variety of sound and mix things together so very good i don't know if that's a long-winded answer to a short, right. short question. it's a perfect answer yes when we were talking about my favorite martian you were telling me the guy who was doing the the uh you know the sound effects for that it's is it the same person would shows like the twilight zone also 
fit that category or lost in space or even dark shadows. You know? I, I, you know? I think so. It really would depend on the time period because he really kind of cornered the market at that point in early sixties. So just about anything between about 1960 or 61 and let's say 65, well, 66, he was still going strong because of um, uh, good vibrations and pet sounds and everything. So it's, mm. I would say probably. I mean, I, I don't know because I don't even know if he would be credited, you know, in the credits at the end, you know. So I, I'm not sure because he was just part of the part of the mix. But uh, I would say probably Paul Tanner because he did quite okay. a few things. In my Theremin book, I, I describe in, in some detail. And I, I have to say, I don't remember exactly all the shows that he was involved with, but I believe I listed a few of them in the Theremin book. So I, I can go look that up again. I mm. I don't know. It's it's funny sometimes when um, uh, when you forget things that are in your own book. But I, I know when I look at something like a complexity, uh, Alan, of your of your latest book, I'm thinking, my goodness, you know, I, it's incredible. So you know, five years from now, will you remember every every detail in there? If somebody asks you, you know. Well, it took two of us to write that book, so but, I can always right. ask the co-author. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. By the way, Walter Sear also did some uh, some. Uh, stuff with with an actual theremin uh and, and a few tv shows too in the early years but my favorite martian i definitely know <laughs> so that hmm. was uh, that was a perfect connection okay okay so we've covered an awful lot about bob moog and his world um beyond the beatles and um thank you so much for coming albert and uh just to remind everyone the new book here it is. It's Oxford University Press. And when you finished reading it, you should backtrack to this one, the Theremin book, which is University of Illinois. Um, and uh, both of them you can find on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold. Um, if you have a, a website or something that you can direct people to or how people could get in contact with you. Yes. Well, uh, albertglinsky.com is, is my website, and there's a lot of information on there on the new book and uh, on the other book and all sorts of things, and, and my, my composing as well, because I'm a, a pretty active composer. So, uh, well, thank you, you uh, all of you, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Alan, for, for hosting this. Uh, it's, it's an honor to uh, talk to all of you uh, and uh, really appreciate it very much. Well, thank you. So Great much. having you on. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, wonderful thank book. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks. So that was fun, right? You guys have fun? Fantastic. Have fun. Yeah. It was really fascinating, all that information from that book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a really good book. I mean, you know, way, way beyond the Beatles. It's, um, you know, it's 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 a great story, uh, you know, of a a guy sort of coming up with these this way of making new making sounds, you know, um, starting off building theremin kits, you know, as a mail order thing, and then just finding, you know, new new approaches, new ways to do it. But, um, you know, one thing we didn't really get into that much is that there's a lot of collaborations with composers and people who were doing electronic music and and seeing what they wanted, what they were looking for. And he would try and, you know, tailor what he was doing to what they were asking him for. Um, mm. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a great story. You know, if anyone, anyone interested in synthesizers, electronic music, anything like that, it's, it's just, it's a great read. And there are Bronx ties. Yeah. Because uh, Bob Moog went to school, uh, high, uh, Bronx high school of science. Right. 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 There are Bronx. Ties. <laughs> Which who, who, who turned me down. Uh, back in 19... Uh, well, uh, we don't have to go there. But uh, Does he mention whether he was a Yankee fan? I bet he was a Yankee fan. I he probably, well... Uh, and there weren't Mets in those days. <laughs> sure there were. Well, no, there weren't. Well, he might have been a Giants or Dodgers fan, True. although that's highly unlikely. Hmm. I, th I think back then it was more territorial. Sorry. I don't ever remember the Mets and Yankees being a thin thing growing up in the Bronx hmm. um, when I was very young, but it, I think it was more territorial when it came going back to the pre-57 season when there was the Giants and Dodgers. Right. Anyway. I think yeah. I think it was, yeah. 
So anyway. I feel like taking calls now here on Things We Said Today. Let's take the next sports call. <laughs> You're next on Things We Said Today. Well, I want to know. Anyway, what we want to know is um, how to get in contact with everybody. Um, and actually, all of our information is in the um, show description box. You can, um, you know, get the links there to click on all that stuff. But in any case, we'll just say what we're up to. And Ken, want to start? Yeah, real quick on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I just did my second show called The Ultimate Beatles Trivia Show, the second installment of that. And I had Joe Mayo on from the other podcast, Beatles podcast that I do, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Um, Glenn Greenberg, who also uh, composed The Beatles Book of Trivia. That was a new bookazine that just came out on the market. And John Tobacco, who was a, a guest on my YouTube channel about eight months ago, Long Island musician, uh, also a DJ on WUSB on Long Island. And they all challenged each other. They were my three contestants with loads of Beatle and solo Beatle trivia. Very much what I've been doing on the radio, uh, on my regular show, Every Little Thing, every single week, and on my website kenmichaelsradio.com it's all for fun there's all these different beetle games that i have in the show as well as just straight out trivia questions and you can check that out and test your knowledge and see how well you do you know i have a blast putting all this stuff together i've loved doing beatles trivia now since i started doing my radio show in march of 82 41st anniversary for me this month and um also the other podcast show talk more talk a solo beatles video cast our next show, which is going to be Monday, uh, March the 20th, 9 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel, we're all going to be ranking the 16 number one solo Beatles singles in the United States, according to the Billboard charts. Wow. On their own, they had 16 number ones. The Beatles had 20. Solo, they had 16. So we're all going to list our favorites in order from 16 to number one and explain why. And... Uh, Again, that's Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. If you want to check out my radio program, Every Little Thing, you can always go to WFDU's website. That's Fairly Dickinson University's website where they run the show Sunday morning, 6 a.m. Eastern, and then they post it in their archival series. They make each show available for two weeks. So go to their website, which is WFDU.FM. And go to their archive page and click on uh, or type in actually every little thing. And you'll be able to listen to the last two weeks of my shows whenever you want. And then there's my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Beatles trivia. Check it out every week. You can win great prizes like the McCartney Legacy, which Alan is modeling right behind him. So mm -hmm. right there. So that's it. Okay. Darren? But I'm kidding. Kidding. <laughs> um, if you want to, uh, you know, the best way, if, first of all, if you want to listen to me on the radio, and I'd love it if you did, uh, WFUV 90.7 FM in New York City metro area, we have a strong signal, but an odd sing signal, because you could go to parts of New York City, you could be driving through parts of, say, Brooklyn, um, or maybe lower Manhattan, and the station kind of drifts in and out and then go way out into Suffolk County on Long Island and we're loud and clear in certain areas. So if there are ever issues with reception, uh, those of you who live up in Westchester, Rockland, Orange, Putnam, there's usually not many, if any, issues there, but uh, we're at 90.7 FM. And if you want to listen anywhere else or reception's an issue, as I've been trying to say, um, <clears throat> as I've been saying, Go to WFUV.org. We also have an app. And I'm on the air uh, from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Monday through Thursday nights uh, and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. Um, and come to my two Facebook pages if you want to be in touch with me, uh, Darren DeVivo. And send me a friend request or the other page I have, which is Darren DeVivo. WFUV DJ and Beatles podcaster, uh, click follow or like or whatever Facebook calls it uh, right now. So uh, that's that. Okay. 
And you can contact all of us um, by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can find us on Twitter at, at things we said fab. And we have two things we said today, Facebook pages, things we said today. And things we said today, Beatles radio fans. And someday we may have a third and get rid of the first two. Um, I've been threatening and I continue to threaten. A new presence on Facebook is a coming okay. and it's coming soon. And we'll let you know. Yes, we'll let you know what you need to do. There is also a McCartney Legacy Facebook page and McCartneyLegacy.com um, on the web, and we're on Twitter too. So you can check all those out on the Facebook page. There's usually some sort of discussion going on, and um, that's that. So for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time.